hope you guys know me, but if you don't, my name's Aubrey. Um, it's just been an awesome summer with you guys. Um, it's just been so much fun just seeing God work through you, through all the things that's been happening. It's been just a blessing to be here. But we've been in this series, and this is the last week of the series, called Unashamed Flame. And basically, um, this is about 2 Timothy. Paul is writing this letter to Timothy, and he's encouraging him to keep having this faith that is unashamed, that he has this bold faith that he continues to live out. And we picked the word flame instead of faith because it kind of illustrates what our faith should be like. Like when you, a fire is first seen from a distance, right? You can see it, it's visible. And then when you get a little closer, you can start to feel the warmth of the fire. And then if you get even closer, you can hear it. And the same should be with our faith. Where at first, people can see our faith. They can see it by the way that we treat others, by the way of just how we live and what the things that we do or don't do. It also should be felt. People should feel the love of Christ from us because of the faith that we have. And then also heard, where we go and we share the gospel and the good news. Well, today we're going to be in 2 Timothy 3, verses 10 through 17. And Paul is talking to Timothy about a thing called persecution. In persecution, it's basically being treated unfairly or cruelly because of one's religion or faith. And I remember when I was in eighth grade, I went to go see this movie called I Am Not Ashamed. It's based off a true story of a girl, her name is Rachel Joyce Scott, and she lived, it's about her life, of how she became a Christian and did all of these things and just the rest of her life. But that, by the end of the movie, there was a school shooting. This is based on true events. And um, they came and they asked her, are you a Christian? And she said yes, and she died for her faith. Now that's what we kind of think of when we think of persecution, right? Dying for one's faith. But persecution, yes, it is that, but it's also, there's relational persecution, there's emotional, the physical like we talked about, and there's a bunch of other things that we can face that doesn't exactly look like that. But throughout this part, Paul is telling Timothy, and he's writing to him, and he's saying, persecution as a Christian is going to come. But then he reminds Timothy what to hold on to when he faces persecution. So it starts off in verses 10 through 11. He says, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, sufferings, What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. So Paul's writing to Timothy, he's like, you you know me, Timothy. You know what I teach about. And we see throughout the whole New Testament that he teaches about how Christ has died for our sins, risen from the dead, he rose again three days later, and how he is Lord over our life. He's saying, Timothy, you know what I teach about, what I tell others about. And then he goes on to say, you know how I live my life. You know, I, these aren't only just the things that I'm saying, but these are also the things that I'm living out. And he sums it perfectly in Philippians 1.21 of his life. And he says, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. This means that he lives in this world for Christ. That everything that he does, he wants to magnify his name and make it about Christ. And he doesn't fear death because death is actually better because he gets to actually be with Christ. So that's what he means when he says he is living when dying is gain. And then he says, Timothy, you know my purpose. My purpose is to tell people about the gospel and share it and love others and live this out. So he's saying, Timothy, you know me. He also goes on to say, you know my faith and patience and love and endurance. Now these four things are a really good quality of a Christian, right? These four words give the idea of someone waiting with hope or someone waiting with steadfastness. Because it's not like, uh, oh, you're waiting in line for Mickey D's or something trying to get your nuggets. It's an actual like longing and hoping for. Because faith is a loyalty to this Christian belief. It's a long time. It's a loyalty that is committed. Then there is this patience that requires long suffering, that you continue to have to be patient. Then there's this love that is constant and is steadfast and continues to stay no matter what. 
And there's this endurance that's a brave endurance that no matter what may happen in life, he can continue to keep the faith. He's saying, Timothy, you know how I live my life, and it's for Christ. And you know how I hope and long for Christ. You understand this. And then he also says what's a part of his life is persecutions and suffering. You see, Paul acknowledges that faithful service does bring suffering. And he, he shows this to Timothy. He's saying, I've been faithful with all of these things. I've lived for Christ. I've done everything for him. And I also suffer from persecution. He even lists specific places where he was persecuted. One of them, he was stoned to death. And you're like, what? But then God revived him. And so he continues to say these things. He's like, you know that I've lived my life for Christ, but I still suffer. Then he finishes off this verse with saying, yet the Lord rescued me from them all. And this doesn't mean that he didn't struggle, that he didn't doubt, that he didn't suffer. It actually just means that it didn't last forever and he didn't die. Because sometimes I think we get shocked when we continue to suffer for things. But Paul continues to say in verse 12, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And I know we look up to Paul, and he's, I mean, he wrote a lot of the New Testament, right? He's this great man of faith. Like, he's done awesome things. And we're like, oh, but that's just Paul. Like, Paul is just bold and courageous and all these great things. But the same spirit that lived in Paul also lives in you. And he's saying this is not a rare thing for a Christian to suffer from persecution. It's actually the norm. He's saying, actually, everyone who is following Christ and is living this out will be persecuted. And when he says, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, it also means willing. And friends, are we willing? Are we willing to live this life for Christ? David Platt says in his book, Radical, he says, are we willing to obey the orders of Christ? Are we willing to be like him? Are we willing to risk our lives to go to great need and to great danger, whether it's in the inner cities around us, the difficult neighbor across the street, the disease-ridden communities in Africa, or the hostile regions in the Middle East? Are we willing to fundamentally alter our understanding of Christianity from an approach that seeks comfort in the world to an approach that forsakes comfort in the world to accomplish an eternally significant task and achieve an eternally satisfying reward? Are we willing? to go through that and to actually live it. Not just talk about our Christian faith, not just go to church, not just all these things, but live it out in our day-to-day life and be like Jesus. Because if we look at Jesus' life, he was the only person that was perfect, that completely followed God's law, but yet he suffered the most. He was the only truly innocent man, yet he died a criminal's death. He felt abandoned from his friends. One betrayed him. He was mocked at. He was beaten. He was persecuted for preaching the good news of the gospel. And Paul says, we will also be persecuted. Jesus says in John 15, 18 through 20, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong in the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they obeyed my teaching, they will also obey yours. Paul says in Philippians 1.29, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Mark 8, 34 says, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. When does the Bible ever say that our life will be easy? God doesn't lie to us. He's not lying to you. He's being honest. He's saying actually following him is really hard. And Paul even continues to say in verse 13, while evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So he's saying, life's going to get hard, and the evil in this world is actually going to get worse. 
at times. And it's going to be really hard to keep this faith. Some of us might be asking, then why in the world would I want a faith like this? Why would I want a faith when I know I'm going to be persecuted or hurt by my friends or friends betray me and leave me or people making fun of me or all these things? Why would I want a faith like that? Why would I want to suffer for this? Why would I be willing to suffer for this? And it's because Jesus did it for you. See, he came to this world. He didn't have to do that. And he lived the only, he was the only person who was perfect, but yet he suffered so much and he died on the cross for your sin and for my sin so that we can have eternal life with him. Friends, he's not trying to be against us and trying to hurt us, but he's actually trying to give us life. But he's warning us and saying, life will be hard, but keep this in mind. Paul says in verses 14 through 15 to Timothy, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. Because you know those from whom you've learned it. And how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through Jesus Christ. Paul is telling Timothy, remember who God is and what he has done. We just sang about it, right? What he's done. He's saying, remember who he is. Remember what he has done for you. Remember what he's just done for you in your life. If you've ever had a moment in your life where you can fully just know that God was real, he's saying, remember that when life gets hard and persecution is coming and it just seems like the evil is winning. He's saying, remember who God is and what he has done for you. And he's also saying, remember what he says in his word. Because yes, Life will be hard, as he said in Mark 8, 34. As being a Christian, we have to deny ourselves and take up our cross. But in the next verse, Mark 8, 35, it says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. He actually wants to give you life. And he's saying, I'm being realistic with you. Life is gonna be hard, but this is so good. And I want to give you this gift. And he's saying that the Bible, it doesn't, the Bible isn't our salvation. Reading your Bible doesn't mean you're saved, but it helps when you are being persecuted. It's so helpful. Paul finishes off in verses 16 through 17 and says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Guys, the Bible isn't just something that we have to read. That's just a checklist off of our Christian faith. But it's actually so good for us. It's actually helpful for when life is hard and when things don't make sense. It's actually helpful for us. It lets us know God's heart and what it means to actually live out our faith unashamed. And we can continue to go to God's word knowing that when we are struggling with a lot of things, when we have doubt, when we are struggling, he has promises for us. When we are saying, and the persecutions of this world is coming, when we're saying, I just feel so scared, I'm so afraid, he says in Isaiah 41 that he is with you. There's no need to fear. When we feel that we're just too far gone and that there's no way that we could possibly be in the love of the Father, Romans 8, 39 says nothing, and that means nothing can separate you from God's love. When we feel worthless and just like, oh, I don't know, I just, I just don't feel worthy of being a Christian or I don't feel worthy of these things that God is doing, he says in Ephesians 2.10 that you are his masterpiece. And friends, he wants us to live this unashamed faith to go out so that others can know him. But again, as I've been saying all summer, this doesn't mean perfection. Because I know we we'll like to go to that sometimes. It's like, oh, I have to go out and I have to be persecuted to be a real Christian. But it's about our heart posture. Paul finishes off this letter in 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. And he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now, did he say, I fought the perfect fight and I never stumbled and I never struggled? No, no. He says, I fought the good fight. Did he say, I got first in the race and I never ran out of breath and I never wanted it to stop? No, no, no. He says, I have finished the race. 
Did he say, I've had this perfect faith. I never doubted. I never feared. I never questioned. I never struggled. No, he says, I have kept the faith. It's not about perfection. It's about your heart posture towards God. Because when I was sharing about that movie from earlier, that girl that died for her faith, in that movie, I'm not ashamed. I remember, like, you knew that she died for her faith. And I was going into this movie, and I was like, she's the perfect Christian, right? Like, she does the ultimate of, I love God more than anything else in this world. So I was going into this movie as an eighth grader thinking, oh, she's got it figured out. I'm going to go learn and see what she did. She didn't start off as a Christian. She went through high school. She was in high school, and she was doing some things with her friends that just weren't really good. But then during summer, she had this moment where she went away and she was talking with her aunt and her cousin and God just broke her heart. And she wanted to have a real relationship with God. And then she goes back to school. I think it was like her junior year or something. And she's going back. But then there's still that tension and that struggle because her friends are still the same. And they're expecting her to be. And so when she starts like taking a step back of, oh, I don't want to do those things anymore, and she was really timid at first, her friends came up to her and were like, what are you doing? And she said, I, I can't do these things anymore. And they left her. And then she had some moments in her life where she was bold and courageous, and she was a part of her church, and she was going out and bringing people to church and just boldly claiming the name of the gospel. But then there were other times with other people where she would hide her faith from them and not let them know who she was. See, she was just a teenager who was struggling, but she was just so deeply loved by her father that she was willing and she wanted to live this life for him. And she would let other people know about Jesus, but she continued to struggle. And at no point did she ever figure it out. And then she died. And I believe that was just the Holy Spirit speaking through her. And I remember I was with my mom to watch that movie. And I walk out of this theater with my mom. And I'm just thinking. And I was like, she was a mess. But so am I. And I thought, man, if God can use someone like that, can he use me too? So I'm walking out with my mom. And I say, mom, I want to impact people like that for Jesus. She said with full confidence in me, she said, you will. And I don't believe that was just because of who I am, but it's because of the Holy Spirit and because of the God that we serve. And friends, I want to invite you in this time to take that step. As we're going back into our school, as we've had a summer away, and God has done some great things here. But as we're going back, what needs to change? Um, I'm going to give you guys this time to respond. There's tables around, and they have these cards on them that say, to live out a faith that is unashamed, I need to blank. And not everyone has to fill this out. If you don't feel led or you don't know what you would write, you don't need to do it. But if the Lord is placing something on your heart, something tangible, something that you can do, of whether it's, I need to have a conversation with this person and begin to forgive them where I need to go and invest in one person this whole year and just really pour into them. Whatever it is that you may think that God is just pushing you to live out of faith that is unashamed for him, what would it be? But friends, I want to remind you, as Christians, we will face persecution. Life is going to be hard. But we can hold on to and trust that God's word is faithful to us. And he says, I've given you life, and I'm with you. And this is how we can live a faith that's unashamed. So I'm going to pray, and Jaden's going to sing the song, Jesus, Have It All. And would you respond in this time of going back, you can take um, the cards and bring it back to your seat and write it down, and then keep it. Put it in your Bible, put it in your room, put it someplace where you can see it and remind yourself how you're going to live unashamed for Christ this year. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
I thank you so much that you're with us through it all. This life is hard, and there's a lot of pressures from this world and evil that is surrounding us, but God, you are good, and we can go to you for comfort. We praise you so much for everything that you have done for us, and God, we just ask that we can go out and spread your kingdom all the more as well. Father, I pray for these students in their hearts as they're going into school this year, that they can be lights in their classroom or in their teens or in whatever that they're doing in their workplaces or wherever they might be. They can be lights for you and have a flame that is unashamed, have this faith that is for you. We love you and we praise you.